באיחור אקדמי אנחנו רוצים להתחיל? אז ברוכים הבאים להרצאת אורח על שם בלנקשטיין ולשם התחלה אני מזמינה את פרופסור איריס ערבות, הדקנית שלנו. ערב טוב, גוד איבנינג. מיסטר מקס בלנקשטיין, רפרזנטטיבס אנד פרנדס אוף דה בלנקשטיין פמילי, אור אונורבל גסט, ארכיטקט ג'ני סבין, פרופסורס, קולגס, סטודנטס, גוד איבנינג אנד וולקאם. אנטיל סבל מומנטס אגו, The senior executive vice president of the Technion was is us, and he apologized because for some family reasons he had to leave. So, um, hello everybody. Uh, thank you all for attending the 2018 Morley Blankstein Lecture. This prestigious lectureship hosts architect Jenny Sabin from the Department of Architecture at Cornell University. Excellence is the first and foremost goal of the Faculty of Architecture and, and Town Planning at the Technion. The process of educating excellent architects is long and multifaceted. It comprises a structured set of courses delivered by knowledgeable faculty and supported by a dedicated staff. It includes guided self-studies in the form of projects and exercises. It includes excursions, readings, labs and workshops, and much more. And still, all this is not enough to provide, to provide the kind of quality <coughs> education we strive to provide. An important component of such education is to bring in leading architects, landscape architects, town planners, and <coughs> industrial designers who can share with us the latest and greatest in the professions. We are fortunate to have the Morley Blankstein Lectureship, which allows us to bring in once every year a leading professional, not merely for a public lecture such as this one, but for a full day of meetings with students and faculty, master classes, and engagements with us in an extensive manner. The Blanchin Visiting Lectureship was established by the Winnipeg chapter of the Canadian Technion Society. The Blanchin Lecture Series represents one of the most important events in the annual faculty calendar. It marks the start of the spring semester and aims to showcase prestigious architectural practitioners, their <coughs> experimental dimensions and <coughs> international contribution. Pritzker Prize Tom Main, Dean Nader Tehrani, Swiss architect Roger Diener, and landscape architect Adrian Hause, principal of West Aid, represent some of the world-renowned architects who lecture the Technion Faculty of Architecture in this framework. The Morley Blankstein Lecture Series provides an outstanding opportunity to address leading issues that architects and scholars address both locally and internationally. The future of the city, the role of digital technologies in our life, the understanding of environmental challenges, and the social dimension of architecture represent as many themes as we wish to address in this lecture series. I wish to thank our sponsors, the family of the late architect Murray Blankstein for his and their generosity and his foresight in establishing the visiting lectureship. I also wish to thank Dr. Daphna Fischer Wirtzman, who worked tirelessly to bring in our guest, and to Limor Abbas Or for the arrangements making this visit possible, to Professor Aaron Sprecher, who chaired the, com the committee that had proposed the list of invitees for the coming three years, and the all others who helped organize this very important event. Thank you very much.
So I'm very happy to introduce Jenny Sabine. Jenny is an outstanding young architectural designer whose work is at the forefront of a new direction for the 21st century architectural practice. She investigates the intersections of architecture and science and applies insights and theories from the biology and mathematics to the design of material structures. Sabine is the author and Isabel Weisenberg, Associate Professor in the area of Design and Emerging Technology and the Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Architecture at Cornell University. She is the principal of Jenny Sabine Studio, an experimental architectural design studio and Director of Sabine Design Lab at Cornell. She is the co-founder of the Sabine and Jones Lab Studio with biologist Peter Lowe Jones. She is also a funding, founding member of the Nonlinear System Organization, which is a research group started by Cecil Belmont, which we all know. Sabine's collaborative research has been funded substantially by the National Science Foundation with applied projects commissioned by diverse clients, including Nike, Autodesk, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, the American Philosophical Society Museum, the Museum of Craft and Design, the Philadelphia uh, Redevelopment Authority, and the Exploratorium. Jenny Sabine uh, has been awarded with many awards such as the AIA Henry Adams First Prize Medal and the Arthur Sprade Brook Gold Medal with Distinguished Work in Architectural Design, the Pew Fellowship in Arts and was named the USA Knight Fellow in Architecture, uh, the prestigious uh, Architectural League Prize for Young Architects and was named the 2015 National Ivy Innovator in Design. Uh, the Architectural Record National Women in Architecture awarded selected her for the 2016 Innovator in Design. That's very, very impressive. Her work has been published extensively, including the New York Times, uh, the Architecture Review, Azura, A Plus U, Metropolis, Mark Magazine, American Journal of Pathology, Science and Wired Magazine, um, and her book, titled Lab Studio, Design Research Between Architecture and Biology, was published in July 2017. She has exhibited nationally and internationally, including the FRAC Center, Orleans in France, as part of the fifth Cooper Hewitt Design Triennale, uh, in Pyramidal Le Monde at the Centre Pompidou, and this year, Sabine won the internationally acclaim, acclaimed MoMA and MoMA PS1 Young Architects program with her submission, Lumen. So please welcome Jenny Sabine. Thank you. Um, it's a sincere pleasure to be here this evening uh, and to have spent a couple of days with faculty and an incredible group of students. I'd like to thank the Blankstein family uh, for supporting this lectureship. Uh, thank you to Dean Iris Arvat, uh, Daphna, and Aaron, and the Faculty of Architecture uh, for your kind invitation and warm hospitality over the last few days. So today I will address uh, the subject of my talk uh, through the lens of my transdisciplinary collaborations uh, with an interest in developing an alternative material practice in architecture. And this is done through the generative fabrication of the nonlinearities of material and form across disciplines. Um, so I'm going to start by discussing the foundation uh, for this work, and then I'll describe uh, three topical areas um, with two projects, um, both research and practice work, um, following within each of those topics. Now this is a, a video compilation of a series of data sets, models, and simulations that we've produced over the years in the context of my collaborations with material scientists, cell biologists, mechanical engineers, 
and beyond. Now certainly biology and material science present useful conceptual models for us to consider, where form is in constant adaptation with environmental events. It's here that geometry and matter operate together as an active elastic ground, what I like to call a, a datascape. And this morning we talked quite a bit about the integration of form, structure, pattern, and geometry. And I'm interested in how this datascape steers and specifies form in context. And I'll, I'll talk specifically about what I mean um, by context in just a moment. And so it's through direct references to the flexibility and sensitivity of the human body that I'm interested in developing adaptive materials and architecture where code, pattern, environmental cues, geometry, and matter operate together as a conceptual design space. It's also the embedding of material systems with biological relationships and behaviors. So I've, I've never been interested in simply scaling up a beautiful form or shape that comes to us from nature or biology, but to look at the processes and behaviors behind those forms. So on the one hand, it generates models that are at once natural and also artificial. And on a meta level, this marks a shift away from the Cartesian formal orders that we're used to in architecture of column, beam, and arch to an opening towards interiorities, networks, fabrics, and fibrous assemblages that are both pliable, plastic, and open. Now this frequently starts with very simple parts and rules, a set of relationships, that through feedback and iteration produce much more complex wholes. So when I start a research project or a design project that's going to be applied, I frequently don't know what the final form will be, and I'm very comfortable with that. Now this interest probes the productive tinkering and misuse of digital fabrication machines informed by issues of craft and making, I'm a maker at heart, to produce bio-inspired material systems and also software design tools. I like to think of software as a new type of material that have the capacity to facilitate embedded expressions in our built environment. Now similar to Detlef Merton's description of his bio-constructivisms, and that was a term that he coined, the emphasis here is upon the analogic negotiation of morphology and its behavior as a dynamic template that is then filtered through material organizations that again produce models that on the one hand are natural but also artificial. Now we purposefully resist the post-rationalization of complex form through an approach that engages a materially directed generative design process or what I call matter design computation. And this has impact in both science, architecture, and engineering. So one of the questions that drives the research that I do in my lab with my collaborators and my students and research associates and also in my practice is the following. How might buildings behave more like organisms responding to and adapting to their built environments? And I believe in the not so distant future, materials will not just be elements and things and buildings. They will generate immersive spaces that act upon and respond to affordances in our built environments. So I'm very interested not only in the functional characteristics of these materials and they, how they contribute to the topic of sustainability and the built environment, but I'm also interested in topics such as personalizing architecture and interactivity. So like the cells in our bodies, sensors and imagers will learn and adapt, making materials not only smart, but also aware sensate and beautiful, we will be able to tune our spaces to personalize our architecture. So some of the foundation for this work, um, I've been at this now for about 15 years, um, and early on I struck up a conversation with Dr. Peter Lloyd-Jones, uh, who's a longtime collaborator uh, with, with me, and we just published a book uh, called Lab Studio, uh, which I'll talk about at, at the end of my talk um, briefly. Now Peter is a cell and molecular biologist, um, also known as a matrix biologist, and so he introduced 
um, me to the extracellular matrix, which is a really incredible concept uh, in biology. And if I had to summarize, basically half the secret to life resides outside of the cell. So you have code or DNA that informs form and morphology, but that's only half of the story. You also have protein events that are happening within the extracellular matrix, the architectural environment that cells integrate and communicate through that affects form. And so these are some of the characteristics of the ECM. It's a dynamic protein network. It's a historical document. It's a master regulator of function. And so this presented to me early on a series of very potent ecological models coming from the extracellular matrix to begin to think about how we might begin to embed a degree of reciprocity and feedback into our design processes. Now, another long-term collaborator who I continue to formally collaborate with, uh, Dr. Xu Yang. Uh, she is a material scientist engaged in biomimicry and the true definition of the word. Uh, she's interested in extracting principles, characteristics from nature, synthesizing that, abstracting that, and then re-engineering and designing new materials. So she looks at, for example, the leaves of lotus plants uh, to produce superhydrophilic or superhydrophobic materials, so water absorptive or water repellent. Uh, she also looks at the feet of gecko uh, to pr produce sticky materials. And I'll talk about a project that we have developed together called eSkin in just a moment. And then more recently, um, at Cornell, working with Dr. Dan Lau, who's a bioengineer engaging both material science, uh, engineering, and biology, uh, who's doing some incredible work with 3D printed hydrogels uh, infused with DNA sequences. And so we're looking at how the promise of pro programmable matter can be integrated uh, into architectural assemblies. So minimizing the amount of energy into a system uh, so that the materials themselves actuate on their own makeup. Now, when I started these conversations with Peter uh, in 2005, um, 2004, uh, we importantly did not set any strict goals. Uh, we had a shared commitment uh, to, at most, um, hopefully generating a collaborative space across disciplinary boundaries. And we thought, at the very least, we would at least generate some new questions. And so we spent about a year, I mentioned this to a couple of students earlier this morning, just figuring out how to communicate. Um, because, you know, it's one thing to, to talk about transdisciplinary collaboration, interdisciplinary collaboration, but when you get down to it, it's really difficult to do. We have different structures for how we teach, how we publish, how we get grant funds, and so on. And so he would join my studio reviews, and I would join his lab meetings. Uh, he quickly became completely freaked out by the culture of the crit. Uh, he thought we were very mean to our students. Uh, and, and I also had to let just a lot of information wash over me. And we were never interested in turning scientists into pseudo-designers and architects, or architects and designers into pseudo-scientists, uh, but to generate a collaborative space uh, together. Now, over the years, that's translated into a series of phases uh, that have been formalized, uh, which you see here. We typically start with a generation of tools uh, to model behavior. Sometimes that might be a particular material. Other times that might be a particular data set uh, coming from biology. And then some of those tools are brought into the realm of, of prototyping. So beginning to productively contaminate the process with the stuff of making and architectural questions. And the third phase uh, is bringing some of those successful prototypes, and I'm going to talk about a series of projects that I see at the prototypical uh, level into the built environment. Um, and into architecture. So it's a purposefully slow process um, to also meaningfully grapple with the problem of scale. And I'll come to that um, very quickly. So I'm going to start uh, with adaptive materials uh, as a topic and talk specifically about the eSkin uh, project, which really builds upon that fundamental question that I just posed in terms of thinking about how buildings could perhaps behave more like organisms responding to environmental cues. 
Now, Peter and I launched a Lab Studio uh, in 2005, 2006. Um, at that time, I was at the University of Pennsylvania teaching in the School of Design. I was there for six years before accepting my position at Cornell. And we went after a grant together uh, with other collaborators, including Shu. And the National Science Foundation, which is a federal funding arm uh, in the states, put out a call for collaborative teams that would include architects. And they were interested in how we would address the topic of sustainability uh, in buildings. And importantly, they were also very interested in how we might reconceptualize our approach to the problem. And so this was the team, including biologists, architects, material scientists, and mechanical engineers. And so we started from this point of departure, which was uh, to consider a dynamic reciprocity um, in the development of thin film technology. And, and we proposed that we could develop thin film that could be integrated into either existing facade design or into new facade construction. And so what do I mean by dynamic reciprocity? Well, it goes back to the extracellular matrix as code. And so what you see here is a PDMS substrate, which is an organic polymer. Uh, this has been produced in uh, Shu's lab. And she uh, does a lot with photolithography and fabrication. And you can see an array of pillars and a single smooth muscle cell. It's a human cell. It's a kind of outer covering cell. And its internal structure, its cytoskeleton, you can see it lassoing up and around these pillars here, and the nucleus stained in, in blue. Now, we weren't proposing to put human cells on buildings by any means. Uh, human cells work very well in our bodies, but at the scale of a building, they would quickly become sick and confluent, and they would die. But the cell was our muse at this scale in terms of um, experimentation. And so we were interested in how changes in compliance and patterning, and geometry, and thickness, and fabrication, and design would affect the behavior of the cell. And the, so the cell was a stand-in in terms of extracting a set of behaviors that we could then synthesize, engineer, and redesign sensors and imagers that would be locally dumb, but would learn over time, adapting to environmental uh, responses and constraints. So, what were we actually doing? Um, this is an example of a predefined geometric pattern, and it's embedded within a shape memory polymer. And it's displaying what's called structural color change uh, under both deformation and recovery. And so literally what is happening, uh, we talked a little bit about this um, last night at a wonderful dinner at Daphne's uh, home, is that we're stretching a piece of, of this e-skin material, and those pillars that we just saw, or in this case, a series of pores, would change their orientation. And in turn, that changes the, the way that light behaves in terms of how it reflects and also refracts through the material. And to our eye, we perceive a color change, right? So it has everything to do with the behavior of light. It's not pigment-based by any means. So we began to imagine um, the possibility of personalizing and tuning windows on demand. Right? So taking that same concept, but scaling it up into a thin film technology that could be integrated into facade design. So a tunable window, dynamic response uh, through interaction, and through a series of exhibition invitations, I was able to push my collaborators, who mostly do fundamental research, so they're not necessarily, uh, it's not that they're not interested, but they just don't do application. Um, but through these exhibition invitations from the FROC um, as part of Archilab uh, and later at the Pompidou and, and others, we were able to really consider how this could operate at a building scale. Uh, in this case, developing our own rendering software and simulations uh, to look at dynamic color change. And so we actually worked with data coming from the e-skin material. Uh, we had to write our own algorithms for this because there was nothing available that could handle the complexity of, of that data testing it at a room scale. And then one of my favorites, this was a prototype uh, that came about uh, also through the Archilab uh, invitation at the FROC, which was titled Naturalizing Architecture. And we were interested in developing a human scale prototype that could operate as a switch between opaque 
transparent and a colorful uh, display. And so these were some of the early schematics. Again, putting the human at the center of the design uh, scenario and thinking about degrees of response as a set of design drivers. Now, we quickly found uh, that if we wanted to scale up the e-skin material, uh, it was going to take forever to fabricate. Now, most of my collaborators think that something at the human scale is massive, and you know, even something this big is, is huge in the world that they work in. And so it was going to take far too long to fabricate many of these little tiles and to aggregate them, and it was also very expensive. And so we started to look at other materials that exhibited the same characteristics and features um, of that organic polymer. And so we did, started working with what are called colloidal particles. They're little nano particles. And you find them actually in many natural systems such as seashells. And this prototype took us about a year and a half to develop, uh, working alongside each other at the lab bench side and in the studio in my lab. Uh, to develop a, a prototype from scratch. And so this was the final prototype. Uh, you can see demo here. And what you see is a series of components uh, which are composed of a conductive glass called ITO. And each component is composed of two sheets of this conductive glass and a solution that's sandwiched between of those nanocolloidal particles. And then there's an array of sensors. We did all of this from, from scratch with the mechanical engineers, my team, and, and Shu, and the material scientists. These sensors detect a change in light intensity. Uh, so what Shu's doing here is passing her hand in front of it. And so those sensors detect a change in light intensity. And in turn, that sends a very small local regional charge, uh, which changes the way that those particles um, pack. And so in turn, that changes the way that light reflects and refracts through it, and we perceive a color change. So this was a huge feat, um, and it's now part of the, the permanent collection at the Frock. And this is where we're at now uh, in terms of next steps. Uh, we completed the four years of the grant, um, engaged in the fundamental research, and now we're looking for industry partners uh, to really take it to the next level and look at the promise of this operating at a building scale. Now, a connected uh, project, uh, which we're still working on, and I mentioned this to one of the students who is doing a really great project on uh, deployable systems, uh, that builds upon eSkin. Uh, this is Kirigami, uh, cutting and pasting in architecture, technology, and, and science. And we were fortunate to secure a, a second grant uh, from the NSF. And I will say early on, Peter and I had a number of naysayers who said, you know, why would you, to Peter, why would you collaborate with an architect? And to me, why would you collaborate with a biologist? Doesn't make any sense. It sounds like just a waste of time. And as soon as we got that first NSF grant, it was amazing. Those same naysayers were suddenly telling us how important the work was. So, so this was a big, you know, a big opportunity for us. And and so we were fortunate to see, secure another uh, big grant. Uh, this time, looking at Kirigami, and working with Shu. Um, on this project, the material scientist, and then also Randy Kamian, uh, who's a theoretical physicist, um, and we've been working on algorithms to model behavior in materials, um, to look at squishy materials and crystalline materials. And I have a little video where Randy's going to describe uh, what kirigami is. Kirigami and origami are closely related. In origami, we usually focus just on folding the paper. In kirigami, we are also allowed to cut it. Cutting it adds a new dimension to the structures we can build. Without folding paper over itself, it is possible to make three-dimensional pop-up structures. In fact, with a little tape or a staple, we can make the structures completely rigid or, left as they are, we can use them as levers and valves. By following a simple set of rules, we can keep not only the paper from stretching, but also all the bonds or edges in the original hexagonal sheet from stretching. We can see where the paper pops up or down by seeing where the hexagons become pentagons or heptagons, respectively. Put together, these folds and cuts can be made into complex variegated structures. So kirigami is, is very similar to origami, but with the addition of cuts and holes, um, which is actually quite useful uh, when bringing in material constraints where we need to consider things like changes in stress, 
uh, and pressure. And so we've been developing uh, with Randy initially a series of tools uh, to look at these particular uh, geometries, um, simulations, uh, exploring uh, the potential of the geometry itself. And then moving into larger scale uh, prototypes, uh, this was a project called Color Folds, where we took the successes of eSkin, um, this time moving away from a single substrate of the material into a large uh, scale assembly of components that would also adapt and change. Uh, so starting to think about developing a certain level of hierarchy uh, in the system. So not only is the e-skin material changing to its context and our um, perception of it, but also each one of these components is folding and unfolding. So we're constantly moving back and forth between physical model making and analog production and the writing of our own algorithms and tools uh, to look at uh, behavior and processes so that. that are then brought to alternate scales. And these are some photographs of the final um, installed prototype uh, called Color Folds. We've since dismantled this and we continue to use it as an experiment. As you can imagine, Scaling up these geometries as soon as you have to deal with thickness uh, bec becomes you know, a whole other set of constraints. Uh, again, we did all of this from scratch, uh, working with mechatronics. This is one of the nodes uh, within one of those folding components, uh, which has a degree of uh, learned behavior uh, within the network. There's a whole network of night and all springs uh, to allow for the actuation, but one of the hurdles that we faced was just simply getting enough power uh, to the system uh, to get it to actually respond. Uh, so we've now since gone back down in scale to really begin to innovate uh, hinge design, um, working with 3D printing uh, to look at the actuation of the material just simply based on how we change the patterning and the geometry of the substrate. And then more recently, um, but I can't quite show this just yet, working with Dan uh, to look at what he's doing with hydrogels and the infusion of DNA sequences and enzymes uh, to create cuts in those sequences to think about a hinge that could actuate just based on its own uh, material makeup. So we're still working on this project, um, pushing forward the Kirigami work, um, but right now we've been really doing a lot of pretty interesting things with 3D printing um, at a micron scale. So I'm going to shift from adaptive materials uh, into thinking about adaptive uh, structure and form and non-standard structures. We talked uh, a bit about that uh, this, this morning in the technology group. Um, and also thinking about scale. Um, as you saw in the previous project with eSkin, uh, we started at a micron scale and in some cases with the material systems a nanoscale. Um, to innovate new materials that could operate uh, at, a, at a building scale to consider adaptive architecture. And we're also very interested in the, the promise of, of 3D printing and not working with 3D printers as a representational tool, uh, but considering how the non-standard uh, can be employed to work at a one-to-one -one scale. Uh, so maximizing the build bed of a, of a 3D printer um, to think about part-to-whole relationships. And so in 2009, uh, we were able to purchase a, a printer. And at the time, it was the largest uh, powder-based uh, printer uh, put out by Z Corp, which is now 3D Systems. And Peter and I were interested in, again, using the printer to look at data at different scales. What, what might it be like to hold data? And so we were working on a series of prototypes um, during that summer as a part of an exhibition at Seagraph. And it was during that, that moment of production that I realized I had a whole body of knowledge in ceramics that I thought I had left way behind. I was done with clay. Uh, that suddenly was, was perhaps going to be quite useful. And so I thought, wait a minute, why can't we take the Z Corp proprietary powder out of the machine and put on our own stuff. And so this is a photograph of our first successful 3D printed greenware uh, clay parts. And so we moved from buckets of material that cost between 500 to 600 US dollars uh, to my own recipe, which is a high fire stoneware with a little bit of uh, sugar 
and maltodextrin that costs about a dollar fifty um, U.S. dollars. And that has since opened a whole research trajectory, uh, just in terms of something that started out as a little side inquiry. Uh, here you can see the same part printed in the regular media, and then here printed with our clay, uh, bisque fired, so it's chemically changed to ceramic, and then glaze fired. I've taught a, a series of courses, seminars, and more recently, option studios uh, looking at digital uh, ceramics, uh, so bringing this back into my teaching. So in terms of how I work, when I feel confident about a research trajectory that's been percolating in the lab that we've been pushing forward, um, I oftentimes bring it into the studio um, to then let you know, 12 to 14 students really riff on it and take it to another level. And so this has been you know, just really amazing in that context. Uh, in the lab, uh, we've been pushing forward uh, poly uh, polybrick, uh, which is just really questioning the brick as a unit um, that hasn't changed a whole lot uh, in many, many years, precisely because of how they're made, either through molds or extrusion. And so with 3D printing, one can begin to think about how every single brick can be different. Um, and we've gone through a series of iterations. Uh, this was polybrick 1.0. Uh, this is 2.0, bringing in other natural systems, in this case looking at how human bone bones are formed uh, to deal with the kind of paradox of something that's very lightweight but incredibly robust, uh, so highly porous uh, but very strong. And more recently, working with Dan uh, with a third iteration, uh, we he's discovered that clay is an incredible host uh, for life, and so we've been working with a DNA glaze um, as a dynamic living uh, material. And so I'm gonna show a little video that talks about that work here. The production of ceramic blocks and tiles has a long technological and design history. Ceramic modules of standard measurement have been used as building block and replacement of stone for many centuries. Ceramic bricks and tiles, so ubiquitous in their application in the built environment, have surprisingly lacked recognition as a viable building component in contemporary architecture practice until now. Polybrick, our latest endeavor under the topic of digital ceramics in the Sabin Design Lab at Cornell University, showcases next steps in the integration of complex phenomena. This work includes advances in digital technology, 3D printing, advanced geometry, and material practices in arts, crafts, and design disciplines. The first phase of the Polybrick series features the use of algorithmic design techniques for the digital fabrication and production of non-standard ceramic brick components for the mortarless assembly and installation of the first fully 3D printed and fired ceramic brick componentry. Polybrick 2.0 is generated with the rules, principles, and behavior of human bone formation. This allows for the production of variegated bricks that are light and porous at the top of the wall and dense at the base to carry load and maintain efficient structural integrity while also amplifying material and formal expressions. Polybrick 3.0 takes our material investigations to the next level. Synthetically designed with advanced bioengineering, these biobricks will exemplify the cutting edge and future of biologically steered clay and ceramic building blocks in architecture. The two prototypes utilize 3D printed clay, hydrogel, and synthetic DNA. As you can see here, a unique ID stamped with DNA in the form of a C for Cornell is fluorescing within the polybrick clay body. Brick stamping has a long history where variegated size, shape, and stamping indicate place, date of construction, and type, 
and thus serve as invaluable historical documents. With our unique DNA stamps and glaze, we explore the possibility of live signatures and dynamic surface techniques, coupled with non-standard bricks in the context of living matter and digital ceramics. So this uh, body of work actually is now part of the permanent collection at the Pompidou. Uh, it was in an exhibition called Imprime, Imprime Le Monde, uh, Printing the, the World, with a number of really great people, uh, including Neri Oxman, who I know is uh, dear to many of the people in the, in the room. Um, and we're now, obviously, go we've gone back down in scale, um, but looking at how we can begin to uh, scale this up and its potential manufacturability. Uh, in my practice, um, probably the most mature uh, project coming out of this research is Polymorph, which was a part of that same exhibition uh, in 2013, Archilab, uh, at the Frock. And as I mentioned, we, we had one body of work, which was the e-scan work and that prototype. Uh, and then I also uh, had an opportunity to showcase what we were doing with ceramics. And so I was really interested in developing a prototype that would build upon my years of investigation into cellular networks, uh, working with Peter, uh, looking at their morphologies, uh, looking at how surface is designed uh, in, in these networks, how a cell connects to its neighbor, how that neighbor connects to its neighbor to form a sheet that becomes confluent that then folds and further bifurcates to form larger hier hierarchical structures. And so I, I didn't want to work with a particular data set per se, um, but to use the tools that had embedded um, that knowledge and synthesized it um, as a set of behaviors. Uh, to think about what, what would it be like to spatialize a node uh, in space and ultimately to develop a spatial structure um, that had a coherent logic to both how it was networking, um, but also thinking about the role of force as an important design parameter. So thinking about how forces are transmitting through both geometry and material. And we settled after about four months of investigation onto three components uh, that had the capacity to interweave um, in about 250 different ways. And I mentioned in the very beginning of my talk that we frequently start with very simple uh, rules uh, that through iteration develop much more complex holes. And that's really how many systems work uh, in nature. And so you can see this is a, a diagram of the system. And the background organizing principle is based on an equilateral triangle and an isosceles. And that's it. Um, the key was making sure that there was connections across. And this was an early rendering. And so in this case, uh, I wasn't directly printing the components, uh, but working with slip casting, and that was important to the structure. Uh, we did use the 3D printer to optimize for mold design. If you know anything about slip casting, it's really difficult to produce uh, and cast a complex part, you know, something that has many undercuts um, and complex curvature with a simple two-part mold. And so we were able to optimize that with a couple of fairly simple algorithms uh, so that we could then 3D print the positives of that mold. Here you can see one of the three components um, embedded within that. And then make plaster negative casts uh, from that. Um, it's composed of about um, 2,000 digitally produced and hand cast uh, ceramic units. And running internal to the system is a network of stainless steel cable that is entirely in tension. Uh, so it forms a rigid uh, shell structure. So here you can see it starting to take shape. Uh, so as I mentioned, slip casting was important for the, the structural integrity of it um, because it is hollow and we were able to basically thread this tensile system uh, through it. And whoever can figure out how we did that at the end of my talk um, I don't know, you'll get a, a, a sticker. <laughs> um, uh, it took us a while, actually, to figure that out, um, but it's, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, this is the addition by Jacob and McFarlane um, at the Frock in Orléans. Uh, the project is, is now permanently housed here in what they call the turbulence. And these are some images um, during installation. As you can see, 
the kind of woven, lacy uh, surface features starting to emerge uh, from that. And then some final views of it fully installed. I don't think I will ever put 2,000 pounds of ceramic componentry uh, into the air again. Um, but we learned quite a lot in terms of beginning to scale up some of these, um, these ideas and topics. And it changes quite a lot throughout the day with the sun passing through it. Uh, it's not a sphere. Uh, it has a couple of inversions in terms of its topology. Um, and it actually, even though, even though it's quite heavy, um, appears to be quite lightweight. A little side story, uh, Frederick Migru, who was the curator at the time, came through when we were almost finished. And I think we got the award for the longest installation period. Uh, and he, he looked at me and he said, you're really smart. And I, and I, thought, I thought, what do you mean by that? And, uh, and he really loved, loved the project, loves the project. He said, that's not going anywhere. Um, thankfully, he loved it, uh, and so they decided to acquire it. We had thought about it. We had thought about how we might get it down, but we weren't quite certain. <laughs> um, so if you have a chance to visit the Frock, they have one of the most amazing collections of experimental architecture from the 60s forward. They have a lot of the archigram stuff. Do, do go, and, and you, can, you can see this, too. So I'm going to move into my, my third and final topic of um, the three which is looking at adaptive environments, which also moves alongside those three phases that I described at the beginning. Um, so adaptive materials, uh, non-standard structures and adaptive form, and moving into environments um, and issues of, of building ecology. And this also delves into a, another material system connected but um, different uh, from what we've been doing with ceramics and um, the the materials that exhibit structural color change, and starts with the question, what if we could form fit and enhance architecture uh, with the bioarchitecture and performance of our own bodies? And this work started actually from a commission, um, this time coming from Nike in 2012. Uh, they were launching a new technology, which I think is probably familiar to all of you now, called Flyknit, um, and I know one of your dear faculty members is doing some stuff on this. Um, and they invited six designers, architects, um, artists from around the world uh, to basically be inspired by the core benefits um, of, of Flyknit. And those benefits including things like performance, form fitting, lightweight, sustainability. And they were genuinely interested in how we would take those benefits and bring them back into our own disciplines. And so I represented the states, and my city was New York. And out of the six, I was the only one that wanted to work with knitting. And I thought it was really obvious. Um, and so I had done a lot of investigation into weaving, which has its own history in terms of its connections to computation and digital space, which is, blows my mind. Um, but I hadn't done a whole lot on knitting. And so I, I spent um, a couple of weeks with my my team uh, working with a textile designer, Anne Emling, uh, who is an expert uh, with knitting, and just to try and figure out what would be possible. And we looked at things like scalability. We worked with both mechanical knitting machines and digital knitting machines. And alongside that, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this project because I want to save time for Lumen, but just to talk a little bit about the foundation but we just were really trying to figure out how we could begin to control the, the specific parameters of knitting, um, interfacing new machines for fabrication, and how we could steer that um, through our own algorithms and scripts uh, into what would become a pavilion uh, sited at Nike Stadium in New York. And these were some of the early uh, investigations and schemes uh, that I was developing with my team and when it came time to start to produce uh, the project, I was, I'll say, productively naive in thinking that I could find a, a partner um, to do the, the knitting um, at a you know, large scale. Um, and I needed to work with whoever this was going to be quite clo closely uh, to innovate their fabrication processes. And I'll spare you all of the kind of backstories, but everybody thought I was nuts. And and finally, was recommended to work with Shima Siki, 
and they are have continued to be an incredible collaborator. Um, and I'll come back to them in just a moment. And also working uh, with a fabric finisher, Dazian. And so this is a diagram highlighting uh, the sewing procedures uh, for the elements. Very intense. And some images of, of the final uh, pavilion. And so Shimasiki's at the forefront of what's called whole garment knitting, uh, which is seamless uh, 3D knitting, uh, which was perfect for the types of uh, morphologies that I wanted to look at. And in the context of this project and answering to the brief, uh, the MyThread Pavilion integrates uh, the simplicity of knitting processes and its parameters with the complexity of, of human bio data. And so the design is actually steered by 30 uh, data sets that were collected from a series of participants that were part of workshops, and we don't need to talk about that. But that data became an organizer, um, not simply a map or a representation. And here you can see one of those knitted elements so all of the cells and the conical forms are individually digitally knit. Uh, we develop all of the algorithms for how those are assembled um, into a co coherent fabric structure. And then each one of those elements is then pre-stressed into a net of nylon webbing, which actually carries all of the ten tension forces uh, through the system. And these are some images of it fully installed. Um, the base of it forms an elliptical taut ring and some views of the exterior. And it was in this project uh, that I began to really scale up uh, the topic of structural color um, and to look at two high-tech responsive fibers uh, specifically, one being photoluminescent. Uh, so these fibers um, that are, you can see here actually the photoluminescent fibers activating, they absorb um, UV energy, and in the case of lumen, which you'll see in a moment, um, energy from the sun. And then when that energy source goes away, they slowly release that as knitted light. The other uh, responsive fiber is solar active. And so those uh, fibers change color uh, in the presence of UV or the sun. And what's literally happening at a molecular scale is these little crystalline structures that make up the fiber actually enlarge. And so they reflect light differently within the electromagnetic spectrum that allows us to perceive a color change. And there are certain organisms that see that color all the time. And so the, the second project after my thread, I did another project for, for Nike in Berlin. Um, but then a couple of years ago, received a commission from the Cooper Hewitt um, and was really able to take the, the engineering and the integrity of the knit um, to an altogether um, another scale and also um, level in terms of being able to control what is actually very diffi difficult to control in terms of the knit structure. So drawing upon years of investigation um, into cellular mor morphologies, I was in very interested in the possibility of looking at a double surface um, and the connections between that as a point of departure. And you can see some of those um, present here in these early renderings and simulations. So considering an inner surface and an outer surface and a series of conical tubular forms connecting those two surfaces together. Then I was also working quite closely with Arup uh, Engineering. Um, as uh, Daphna mentioned, um, I worked with, with Cecil, actually studied under Cecil Balmond um, early, many, year, many years ago, and then taught with him, and then worked on projects with him as part of the Advanced Geometry Unit, and now continue to, to work with Arup uh, with, with my larger scale projects. And we spent about three months just developing these swatches, um, variegating the, the patterns within the knit so that we could extract um, those principles and behaviors and bring them back into our simulations. And so in, in this particular project, the, the surface structure is not pulled to a frame as it was with my thread, uh, but there's a reciprocity uh, between the external active bending structure, how that holds up the surface structure, and in turn, how the surface structure is held up by this active bending um, armature. And some final Images, again, you can see we, we're, we constantly go back and forth between 
digital work and the development of, of our own scripts and, and so on into very slow analog work. So it's, it's always a back and forth. And importantly, the, you know, the human is very much embedded in, in the process and the human hand. And some final views of that. And here you can see that, that double surface and the photoluminescent threads uh, really articulating the ways that these are constructed uh, and knit uh, seamlessly. And so that brings me to my last project, uh, which I'll spend a, a little bit more time on, uh, which is Lumen. And with, with Lumen, uh, in terms of the process for the Young Architects program, um, there's a couple of different phases. And the first phase, you're nominated. Um, MoMA invites uh, deans of, of architecture programs, uh, practicing architects, uh, curators, uh, and so on, to nominate um, one person. And from that pool of people, which I think typically is around 30 people, you submit your stuff. And uh, then they reduce it down to five. And so there are five finalists who work on a proposal uh, for the installation that always takes place uh, during the summer um, as a part of the warm-up series. And I'll talk about that um, a bit more in just, just a moment. And so I knew strategically, if I was going to win, that I needed to work with a material system that I felt confident about and that had reached a certain maturation of investigation. And so after at that point, almost six years of really pushing uh, the photoluminescent and solar active uh, fibrous assembly, I knew that was it was ready to go outside. And I was also really uh, interested in what we had developed with po with polythread with this double surface. Uh, but instead of having you know this surface at operating at this basically this scale, um, could this actually become something that one could inhabit? Um, to become a, an, an actual architectural space. And so this was, this was an image that really kind of obsessed me as a point of departure. I'm gonna sort of talk over this video a bit. Turn this, down. this was our proposal video. I'll say the time frame that uh, one gets to produce this project is, is interesting. Um, and the, the budget is also interesting. One has to be quite creative uh, in your entrepreneurship of, of getting lots of people on board that are willing to work for free. Um, but turn this down. This video uh, highlights some of the earlier work, but then it takes us through the design uh, process uh, for Lumen. Quite a lot at the site, uh, so the, the two canopy structures are 
there was an amazing array of, of projects too. They were all quite different, actually. Um, so Lumen employs uh, both those the photoluminescent and solar active fibers, uh, but into an altogether um, different scale. And it was the first time that I had taken it outside. And the previous projects I worked with lighting designers uh, to simulate a day to night sequence that was tightly controlled. And here we were relying on the sun uh, for the most part. I did work uh, with focus lighting to amplify that at night um, because an important part of the brief uh, is to provide basically a setting for warm up, which is every single Saturday, where they invite emerging DJs from around the world uh, to perform. People hang out, they eat, they drink, um, and the visitor count goes from you know 100, 200 during the week to 7,000 people. And I'll, I'll show you an image of that in just a moment. So the constraints of the site were, were quite imp important. Uh, there are two main parts of the project. Um, the canopy structure that's tensioned into the existing uh, matrix of concrete walls and three large tensegrity towers, um, which you can see in this image, one of those 40-foot uh, tall tensegrity towers um, that also push the canopy up and become inhabitable uh, program spaces. So as I mentioned, um, ideas of transformation, of materiality, of change, were central to the project proposal, and also thinking about how people um, could make their own arrangements and social spaces uh, within Lumen that could be private and also very public and engaging, and to think about how we could orchestrate uh, the material system and the responsivity of that um, across the entire uh, set of, of courtyard structures. And just some images of some of the models we produced. And I was very interested in how it would change from day to night, that people would have a very different experience um, if they came during the day, during the week, uh, versus if they came on a Saturday uh, during warm-up, uh, when the sheer number of visitors increases uh, quite a lot. And just a couple of images highlighting uh, the spools. Um, here you can see how we deconstructed them. Uh, then we CNC'd uh, the edges here. Uh, so that it became like a cog. And then those were woven, uh, the prototypes were woven with uh, my robot in the lab. And a few details of that. Um, the tensegrity structures were also very dynamic um, in the way that they were conceived. Um, so the, the ropes that they're composed of were uh, made by a company in the Northwest that typically make um, fishing rope and fishing nets. And so they were all customized uh, and brought into tension with that large compressive um, set of masts, which was an interesting uh, set of installation uh, sequences. Uh, here you can see the solar active fibers uh, starting to uh, change color, and also some diagrams highlighting uh, the sewing process of the main canopy. There's over a million yards of fiber uh, in this project, which is a lot. A lot. <laughs> and uh, Dazian, who did the sewing of all the, uh, the units, said that they started on the west coast and ended in, on the east coast. <laughs> um, we started production almost two weeks after I heard that, that we won. Um, again, I knew if we were going to be successful, the design proposal needed to be really far along. And so there were four Shima machines knitting continuously for four months straight. And I orchestrated the timing of the finishing and sewing of the fabric as well. So Daisian started on this canopy first and then finished this canopy. There were many, many, many sleepless nights. Um, so here you can see it being pulled into uh, the existing courtyard walls. I worked with Clayton Binkley, uh, who's just an incredible engineer at, at Arup. We've now worked on four projects together. Um, and his expertise is in tensile systems. Um, so I, I just, I learned so much um, through the course of taking this work to this scale. Um, and fortunately, it was really loved uh, by people and um, new commissions have, have come forward uh, since then. But for me, the most exciting moment, um, which really marked kind of success of the project for, my, for myself, 
is just simply to see how people use it um, and how they interacted with it. Uh, and you know, really um, not only observed how the, the high-tech responsive fibers were changing, these are some views at night of the photoluminescent fibers, um, but really enjoyed the spaces that they created. A lot of people talked to me, especially about this smaller courtyard, um, how it made them feel calm, that they wanted to just lie down and take a nap, um, that they wanted to see it in a park or even a hospital. Uh, so that, that you know, was marked a point of success for, for me. And some more views at night, and of one of those Tensegrity towers. Again, every single detail we had to innovate, you know, together with, with Clayton and his team. Um, Getting this mast up and the, the rings just right uh, with the tension was, let's just say we had some creative rigging taking place at night when nobody could really watch what we were doing. And then some images of it being used and during warm up. I was over here freaking out. <laughs> and some more images of that. So I'm going to conclude with these final images. Uh, I've only shown you a part of what we're up to. Uh, you can visit my website uh, to find out more. As hopefully you've seen, I, I say we a lot. Um, I obviously don't work alone. I work with a number of amazing collaborators and students, um, researchers, and have been fortunate to receive quite a lot of funding over the years. Um, and I'm super excited about the prospect of uh, potentially forming collaborations uh, with you here at Technion, um, maybe through Cornell Tech or, or not. And these are some of the ideas that I'm looking at in terms of next steps. Um, the possibility of a center for engineered living matter and adaptive architecture and really taking this work to the next level. I'm, I'm fundamentally interested in, in how this impacts not only the way we think and the way that we do design, uh, but ho how it will impact the built environment and, and architecture. If you have a chance, you can check out the book. This really is a book about um, methodology and a way of thinking across disciplinary boundaries um, and highlights the work that I did with, with Peter over the years uh, that came out uh, last uh, July in 2017. And the last point I'll make is um, I just recently launched a new degree program at Cornell, uh, which is a two-year Master of Science in Architectural Science with a, a focus on matter design computation. And so if any of you are, are interested in a, a second graduate degree or interested in getting involved, that's, that's one way uh, to do so. And so I'm going to conclude with that. I'm going to just let this video play in the background, and I'm really happy to take questions. But thanks so much for coming out. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Are there any questions? If not, that's that's fine. We're watching the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can turn the sound on too. Okay. Great question. Um, this iterate, I mean, Lumen, it did well for the four and a half months that it was up, and I think we had one of the highest counts of rainfall on record in New York City. Um, this this pro project got hammered <laughs> um, by by people. You saw people dancing in the cones. I mean, everybody wanted to dance in the cones. It was so cool. Um, but I think. It, <laughs> In terms of this iteration, this is, it's not, it, it's not something that could be done permanent. Um, I do have, <laughs> I do have uh, two new commissions uh, coming forward um, where, and I can't tell you just yet, uh, which will allow us to really push the R&D material. Uh, so working with the same features of the responsivity of the threads, but working with a higher gauge thread, fabrication process that isn't as delicate. So this system couldn't be permanent, no. Um, but
but indoors it's great. I don't have done a couple of permanent projects that are, are indoors. Uh, the, I will say that what we've done with the webbing, the nylon webbing, which is what this basically carries the tensile forces through the system and connects each cell to its neighbor, um, is really robust. And so that is some, you know, there are aspects of it that could, that could have more life support. But I'm super excited to take it to the next level. It just opens up a whole set of questions um, for us to investigate. They weren't supposed to do this, but I really loved that they did. They were engineered to take climbers. Water is also part of the grief, and so there's a whole network of misters uh, that had a couple of sensors connected to uh, cellular valves. So you go by and then slowly start to mist, uh, which actually cooled down the whole environment. like the scariest project one can hope, try and do in less than six months, but so amazing and rewarding. I was fortunate to be incredibly professionals. Question, yeah. It helped us win the competition, that's for sure. Um, well, it was, it was really, for the design process, it was a really helpful tool to test uh, how we were going to work with programming the material responses. And, and so the distribution of the threads, where they were within the canopy, uh, and 
you know, just really testing it as a set of simulations uh, was really, really useful um, because the design process was, you know, very, very fluid in terms of a back and forth. So the, the choreography and sequencing of the responsivity of the project, um, where we were, we were going to place the, the misters in the network um, to maximize cooling. But I would say at the end of the day, I, I was, and, and then we also used it for representation and, and presenting the project. Um, and it just made it that much more accessible uh, for people to, to understand. But the reason why I decided, I mean, it was a big ordeal and it took a lot of time to produce a VR model that was accurate enough that would really get at what we were doing. And it was super helpful to, to begin to simulate some of the knit structures. But the reason I did it was I really wanted the jury to understand what, I, what we were trying to do. Um, and so it was an effective tool for communication. Yeah. Since it's outside and it's also a some shading, solving problem, have you ever just thought to involve the landscape architects or by taking it to the next level to make it, I don't know, something? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will say the two projects that are starting now, um, both are in very hot climates, um, and both involve landscape architects. So yes. Yeah. Likewise, yeah, and having more time. Thank you.